Hello, we're back for Section 3, Western Christendom, Rebuilding in the Wake of Roman Collapse. This is a rather long section. I'd like you to keep in mind that this is about um, Christianity in Western Europe after the fall of Rome, um, and with Rome being one of the largest uh, empires in terms of population and land um, and economic activity that we've studied this thus far, um, rebuilding in uh, Europe is very important. So there's a lot that goes with this particular section. Political life, uh, society and the church, um, the, the quickly um, changing um, things going on in, in uh, Europe, um, the Crusades, all kinds of things are going on. So keep in mind that this is a rather long section. <clears throat> okay, so Western Europe... Um, was on the margins of world history for most of the third wave millennium. Um, it was far removed from the growing world trade routes, which we've already studied, like the um, Indian Ocean sea trade, the Silk Roads in Central Asia and East Asia, and the Sand Roads of the Sahara in Africa. Uh, European geography made political unity difficult. The coastlines and river systems facilitated internal exchange as opposed to uh, international exchange. And the modern climate enabled population growth, or moderate climate, excuse me. Now, the let's start with the political life in Western Europe. Uh, the traditional date for the fall of Western Rome, given by historians, is 476 CE. And with the Roman collapse, um, there was a large-scale centralized rule that vanished. Uh, Europe's population fell by approximately 25% because of war and disease. Uh, contraction of land under cultivation is another reason for um, the shrink in population. There's a great diminution of urban life. Uh, Long-distance trade outside of Italy essentially shriveled up, um, and that's where the... Um, internal exchange uh, comes into play. Great, severe decline in literacy. Um, and the Germanic peoples were the ones that emerged as the dominant peoples in the West. And so the shift in the center of gravity uh, moved from the Mediterranean, which is where the Roman Empire was centered, to the North and the West. Now what was the loss, you know, what was lost with the fall of Rome? Well, with the overthrow of the last Roman emperor in the West by the German general Odoacer in 476, that's when Rome officially fell. However, this is merely a moment in a long-term decline of central authority and civilization in the West. Uh, central political authority collapsed. Cities shrunk, um, went under decay. Like I said, literacy lost. Roads fell apart. Trade routes broke down. Um, barter replaced a uh, standard currency, and um, diseases spread among many of the desperate and poor people. But let's take a look at, um, you know, let's, or let's think about some of the aspects of Rome that survived. Well, there's survival of a lot of the classical um, and Roman pieces of heritage. Uh, the Germanic peoples who established the new kingdoms had been substantially Romanized already, um, and they they portrayed this high prestige of things Roman, and the Germanic rulers adopted uh, Roman-style written law. So while things fell apart in the Mediterranean, aspects of Rome survived in especially Northwest Europe. Uh, the Germanic peoples, once viewed as barbarians by Romans, actually adopted Roman law and even military organization. Now, several of those Germanic kingdoms tried to even recreate Roman-style unity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Charlemagne, uh, a Roman emperor, um, ruled from 768 to 814, and he acted imperial, um, which is the recreation of uh, an empire. Um, and we also, and, and this happens with the revival, or this revival of the Roman Empire happens on Christmas Day in the year 800, and that was with the coronation of Charlemagne by the Pope. Unfortunately, um, after his death, the Holy Roman Empire 
uh, soon became fragmented as it was divided up. But there was another revival of the Roman Empire with the imperial coronation of Otto I of Saxony, who ruled 936 to 973. Um, now, Charlemagne as a Roman emperor, this was a, this survival of the dream of, the, of Rome um, is best seen through the crowning of King Charlemagne. Uh, as a new Roman emperor by the Pope, like I said, in 800, and as the king of the Carolingian Empire, he sought to reestablish a standard imperial infrastructure, bureaucracy, and even a system of weights and measures. He would travel out into his kingdom um, and converse with poor people and with peasants. He tried to remain as just and fair as possible. Um, and he he was a very... Uh, commanding presence. He was actually 6'4". He was a big guy. He had a big, booming voice. Um, and many people took to that and listened. Okay, so here we go. This gives you an excellent idea of what we're talking about here. Because um, remember, like we discussed, the center of the Roman Empire was the Mediterranean Sea, right? Rome is here in <clears throat> central Italy. But with the invading Germanic peoples, things become centered to the north and the west from here. Um, this is the Carolingian Empire that's outlined in red that belonged to Charlemagne. Um, after he, he passed, it's divided up into three different territories. Um, purple, Normandy, uh, belongs to Charles the Bald. Green belongs to Louis the German. And orange belongs to uh, Lothar. You'll notice um, Louis the German, right? This eventually becomes German territory. And this um, eventually becomes France. And, of course, uh, hopefully you all are famous with uh, Normandy. And its significance um, with uh, William the Conqueror in 1066 conquering England, and then, of course, um, D-Day in uh, June 6, 1944, um, the storming of uh, the beach to defeat the Germans in World War II. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, let's look at society and the church. Um, within these new kingdoms, you know that that came after the fall of Rome. Um, they were highly fragmented, decentralized um, societies. There was great local variation amongst these different um, areas, and it was really the land owning warrior elite that became um, the authority. They are the ones that exercised their power. Um, and this is also where we see, I mean, this is essentially the development of feudalism in Europe and the um, the Dark Ages leading into the Middle Ages. Um, when Roman authority collapsed, um, the political and military system de that developed, uh, it, it really became a political, economic, and social power of isolated estates or manors, and that's feudalism. And that fell into the hands of the wealthy warriors. And these warrior elites were in constant competition with each other. Um, the lesser knights and lords swore loyalty to the stronger warriors as opposed to one central ruler, and thus the fighting. And frequently they would receive land or even loot for that, you know, in exchange for that military service. And while the slavery of the Roman Empire essentially faded away, peasants were increasingly... Um, not considered personal property, but they were tied to the land on which they work and were not allowed um, or were not free to leave. And so many peasants or serfs uh, spent their entire lives on one manor. And manors were essentially or economically self-sufficient, and there really wasn't a need for them to leave. But in return for access to the land, they had to pay some of their crops and other produce to the Lord. And in return, they also received protection. Um, now those those lesser lords that um, and knights that swore loyalty to others, those 
are what became called uh, vassals. And a fief is the land grant, land grant that they would receive um, in exchange for that uh, military service. <clears throat> and so thus, like I said, serfdom, you know, displaced slavery as it faded out of the Roman Empire. Um, the Catholic Church was a major element of stability during a time of essentially of chaos in Rome. And so the role of the church is uh, very important. Roman Catholic Church had a hierarchical, or hierarchical organization of priests and bishops, cardinals, and was the only surviving institution of the Roman past. Um, thus its importance. Its organization allowed it to administer the faith in Latin and also to amass wealth via taxation or tithing. Um, and that hierarchy actually was modeled on that of the Roman Empire. It became very rich. Um, we see the conversion of Europe's non-Christians. And most of Europe was Christian um, with some pagan elements by uh, the year 1100. Now, um, spreading the faith was important. Like I said, they... You know, there we see conversion of many of the non-Christians in Europe, um, even those that held significant power. Um, and the church worked to convert those pagan Europeans, um, and this was a long, even a slow process. And like I said, sometimes those pagan practices or sites or holidays um, were remade as Christian rituals or churches um, and even sacred days. And on occasion, force was used to spread faith. You know, the church and the ruling class, um, the nobility or the aristocracy, actually are usually reinforced each other. Um, there's an element of competition as um, the rival centers of power, and that's part of the, the conflict um, that develops. Uh, the right to appoint bishops and the pope uh, was controversial, um, in addition to the lay investiture conflict. Um, with the church being the only pan-European institution um, and several relatively weak kings eager to build power within their realms, secular sacred tensions flared over wealth and the right to appoint those bishops. Now, um, there's a... Okay, we're moving on to accelerating change in the West. There was a series of invasions... Um, about 700 to 1,000, and that's what really hindered European development. And many of those invaders were Muslims, Magyars, and Vikings. And if you remember from the map that we just looked at, the Magyars are the ones that are part of uh, Central Europe or from Central Europe. But this had largely ended uh, by the year 1,000, and and that's we see a a new security. By that time, and it was just centuries of Muslim, Viking, and Magyar attacks. Um, but finally, in 1000, uh, security settled into Europe. Now, the weather improved with uh, a warming trend that started after 750. And in the high Middle Ages, there's a time of clear growth and expansion. This, this is an era of economic, political, and demographic, demographic growth. Um, and that's known as the High Middle Ages. Um, it's a clear growth and expansion time for Europe. The European population in, a thousand, in the year 1000 was about 35 million, and by 1340, it was approximately 80 million. Um, <clears throat> and there was also an opening of new land for cultivation, which in turn can support an increase in population. Uh, we see a growth of long-distance trade, especially from two major uh, centers. Um, and and this, this revival of long-distance trade was essential to the economic growth um, that was the revival of those trade routes. Regional routes connected the British Isles to the coast and onto the Baltic Sea. Rivers connected the coasts to the interior. And the cities of the Mediterranean established circuits of commerce. And that was very important. Um, Northern Europe, 
uh, those northern Italian towns. <clears throat> and um, the great trading fairs uh, spread, especially in the Champagne area of France, and enabled exchange between the northern and the southern merchants. Um, and thus, European towns and, that's, and uh, city populations rose. Um, in Venice, which is in Italy, about 1,400 had approximately 150,000 people. Um, that's still considerably smaller than some of the great cities elsewhere in the world. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it was still one of the larger ones in Europe. And uh, there are new specializations that arose with this increase in trade and Thus, Europeans began to organize in guilds, the European merchants. <clears throat> um, the uh, urbanization and specialization of labor um, shows a substantial growth in the cities um, where this spe specialization of labor and professions takes place. The guilds, guilds excuse me, served as a method of organizing and monitoring specific professions. We also see um, a growth of territorial states with uh, better organized governments. Uh, kings consolidated their authority um, between the 11th and 13th centuries. And this is the appearance of professional administrators um, that hold specific positions. And some areas didn't develop territorial kingdoms, however, like the Italian city-states and those small German principalities. Um, with this new security and economic growth, the states became more powerful, and that's the consolidation of power. Um, but like I said, some of the kingdoms, especially in the Northwest, developed large land bases, while the commercially vibrant city-states, um, especially those characterized in Italy, and those small states uh, that dominated the German lands are the ones that remained, uh, remained a little bit different than the consolidation of power like those elsewhere in Europe. <clears throat> um, there are also new opportunities for uh, women. A number of urban professions uh, were open to women. Many widows of great merchants could contend their, continue their husband's businesses. Uh, opportunities, however, declined by the 15th century. But there was an alternative, <clears throat> excuse me, alternative um, there was the religious life. Nuns, um, uh, Beguines, uh, anchoresses. Um, great examples are Hildegard of Bingen and Julian of Norwich. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a rise and fall of opportunities for women. Um, initially, that economic growth opened up some opportunities, um, both in the labor force and in the church. However, uh, men did reassert control or either removed women from certain trades or downgraded their roles, and they lost control over certain church um, things to men from the clergy. And that's the, um, that really comes from the new ideas about mis uh, masculinity, uh, going from a warrior and the ultimate fighter, uh, no pun intended there, <laughs> to being the provider of the household and of the family. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now you can see a huge mix of different peoples and what led Europe to becoming so diverse as it is now. Um, you can see that at, at this time Spain is still part of the Muslim lands which take up northern Africa and over here in the Middle East. And we see many different um, king, local, localized kings consolidating their power to build these larger states. Um, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Scotland, Ireland, England. Um, Alan Dulles, right, that's still part of the Muslim lands. France, uh, here's the Holy Roman Empire, which eventually becomes um, good chunks of Germany. Poland, uh, Kiev and Russia. Uh, remember, we've already talked about the Kiev and Rus. Um, Hungary, Croatia, Serbia, Bulgaria. This is the Byzantine Empire. You can see it significantly shrunk in size. 
um, and all of these little Italian city-states, merchant cities. So hopefully this is a great visual for you. And I love that this map shows the arrows of the different invading groups um, in, you know, all over and into uh, parts of uh, the Holy Roman Empire, as well as uh, the Muslims from Africa and the Vikings up from Scandinavia. Gives you an excellent idea um, and visual of what was going on. Okay. Europe, outward bound, the crusading tradition. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's a medieval expansion of Christendom after 1000. I mean, this occurred at the same time that Byzantium uh, declined. Um, the clearance of land, especially on the eastern fringe of Europe, is part of that, the Scandinavian colonies in Newfoundland, Greenland, Iceland, I mean, Europe had a direct, albeit limited, uh, contact with East and South Asia by the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, merchants, diplomats, missionaries, uh, these Europeans established connections to the outside world and taught and isolated Europe basically what was out there um, and, and all the, the things that they'd never seen before, um, technologies, ideas. Um, foods, all kinds of things. And um, the first crusade began in 1095. So here's that Christian piety and warrior values. The crusading spirit uh, combined the two most important force, forces of the Middle Ages, religious piety and that the warrior ethos. Um, evidently, the European knights were able to overcome Jesus' teachings about peace and love. But these wars were um, expressed as God's command. Um, they were authorized by the Pope, uh, for which the participants received an indulgence, which is a release from penalty for confessed sins. And their crusades were amazingly popular, um, but they were really religious wars at their core. The, excuse me, uh, the most famous crusades were aimed uh, to regain Jerusalem and some of the holy places. Um, the siege and taking of Jerusalem ended in a massive massacre of Muslims and Jews in the very place where Jesus was to have walked and taught his message of love. And this, I mean, there, there were many waves of crusaders that were sent to the Near East. There were uh, the creation of some small, four small Christian um, states. The last one fell in 1291. Um, and it, it showed, you know, by being able to send so many on the Crusades uh, from all over Europe, that really showed Europe's growing organizational ability. Um, these were states in the Middle East held by Crusading Knights uh, actually for almost two centuries, those four small Christian, Christian states. Um, but some of the most, I mean, there's Iberia, the Baltic Sea, Byzantium, even Russia. These regions all experienced um, attacks from crusading knights. The Christians fought mainly against Muslims, even pagans, and some Eastern Orthodox communities. And so, but... Believe it or not, the Crusades had a little lasting political or religious impact in the Middle East um, than they did in Europe. And that's, that's what the, the book um, says and what the focus is. Um, there are some historians and um, other scholars with noted work that the Crusades might have had a, a lasting um, religious, maybe political, because it's linked with Muslims, uh, impact on the Middle East, um, especially with not necessarily just what happened in France on Friday, but with many other things um, and the continuing fighting between uh, Muslims and Christians that, uh, you know, essentially still happen today. So there are some that do believe that it has had a lasting um, political and religious impact in the Middle East, just not as evident as it was in Europe. 
I mean, you know, it for the Middle East, the Crusades, the, I mean, they were less important than the invasions from the Turkic peoples and the Mongols. Um, but it wasn't until the era of the 19th and 20th century that Western imperialism, that the Crusades were widely discussed in the Islamic world. And that's, that's probably the resurgence um, that we've seen in the last 50 or 60 years. But um, the, the Crusades did have a significant impact on Europe. Um, the cross-cultural trade, technology transfer, even intellectual exchange, um, the conquests of Spain, Sicily, and the Baltic regions, the Crusaders weakened Byzantium, the popes um, were able to strengthen their position for a time, and tens of thousands of Europeans made contact with the Islamic world. Um, so the, you know, the Crusades did give Europeans exposure to new goods, uh, like sugar and spices and ideas from Islamic technology and Greek learning. Um, and this also led to a hardening of boundaries. And while trade did come from the Crusades, it also hardened the divisions between the Roman Catholics and the Muslims, Jews, and the Eastern Orthodox Christians. And here is another map. Uh, gives you guys another excellent visual of um, the Crusades. <clears throat> of the first, second, third, uh, fourth Crusades, of course, the Christian attacks in Spain, the Reconquista, right, to reconquer Spain from the Muslims. Um, and uh, it, it's nice that it gives you a good, um, colorful visual of the Catholic Christianity, um, the Orthodox Christian lands here in blue, um, all of Islam that's in green, and then, you know, some of those pagan areas. Um, that haven't, you know, that hadn't converted one way or the other. Still in that khaki color. Um, but it shows you their uh, routes to the Holy Land. Um, and you can see all right along here how important um, this area is. And, you know, it, and it, still, it still is today. Um, you know, this is a good chunk of the fighting in Syria right now. Um, there in uh, the Middle East. It's a four or five year civil war there. And one visual for you. Oh, I, this picture is fantastic. So who are the figures in this painting? Um, let's take a look here. On the extreme left in this image stands a monk or maybe even a priest um, identifiable by his robe and his hood. Right, he seems to be speaking to a densely packed row of soldiers, right, dressed in European armor. Uh, it looks like they're aiming their bow and arrows upward. I mean, in the center of the image stands a tower on which a man um, in the same European body armor and bright golden crown looks toward the similarly dressed soldiers below him. Uh, behind the crown figure, in the upper right half of the image, seeing a group of soldiers pointing bow and arrows as well as rocks downward from the top of the fortress toward the attackers. Um, they're not wearing helmets, but they have their heads draped in white cloths instead. So the historical event here shown in this painting, illustrated in this painting, well, this is actually um, a painting that illustrates the Christian seizure of Jerusalem in 1099. The crowned figure in the center is the French knight and nobleman Godfroy de Bouillon. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Um, but uh, you know, he figured prominently in the attack and was briefly known as the king of Jerusalem. Now, here's one for you. Can you explain the figure in the upper left corner? On top of the painting, um, like maybe on the edge of the frame of this illustration, sits a knight with a shield 
featuring a yellow lion against the blue background. All right, see, there's the frame. All right, he's perched on top of the frame. Hmm. He's looking outside the picture to the left, but is pointing to the right with the painting with his right arm, right? But he's looking this way. <laughs> As if to direct viewers from the outside of the painting toward the scene of the battle and the fortress that's Jerusalem. Huh. This is going to have been the artist's way of turning this image into a call for a new crusade and a renewed effort at capturing the holy city. Right? A whole new, a uh, whole new fight. Hmm. All right. Interesting. Um, again, like I said, I know it was a long section, um, but Western Christendom, uh, you know, in Europe, that's, that's a lengthy section, a lot of information. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. I will see you again for the West in a comparative perspective.